On a cold and gloomy November night in 1975, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald left Superior, Wisconsin with a full load of iron ore. She was one of the largest and most powerful freighters on the Great Lakes at that time, but tragically she would never reach her destination. As she sailed across Lake Superior, a fierce storm blew in that caused the ship to split in half and sink, taking 29 crew members with her. This disaster left shattered not only wreckage at the bottom of the lake, but also questions as to what caused this vessel to suffer such a fatal fate. There have been numerous theories posed as to why this tragedy occurred, but none have been definitively proven. What happened? How did the SS Edmund Fitzgerald sink? Who was responsible? Is there any way that this catastrophe might have been prevented? Who was the DJ captain? Let's dive in. SS Edmund Fitzgerald was an American Great Lakes freighter that sunk in Lake Superior during a storm on November 10th, 1975, killing the whole crew of 29 men. She was the biggest vessel ever to sink on the Great Lakes of North America when she was launched on June 7th, 1958. On November 14th, 1975, a US Navy aircraft detecting magnetic anomalies identified her in the deep sea and she was shortly discovered to be in two big pieces. The Edmund Fitzgerald sailed the Great Lakes for 17 years, transporting taconite iron ore from Minnesota's Duluth region to the steel mills in Detroit, Toledo and beyond. Captain Peter Pulser was known for piping music over the ship's intercom while sailing through St. Clair and Detroit rivers or between Lakes Huron and Erie and amusing onlookers at the Sioux Locks with a running commentary about the ship. As a result of her massive size, impressive speed and DJ captain, the Edmund Fitzgerald quickly became a fan favourite among boat observers. On the afternoon of November 9th, 1975, she left Superior, Wisconsin, close to Duluth, with a full load of raw pellets and Captain Ernest M. McSorley in charge. The Edmund Fitzgerald met up with the SS Arthur M. Anderson, another taconite freighter, as they headed to a steel factory in Detroit. The two vessels were then trapped in a strong storm on Lake Superior the next day, with gusts approaching hurricane strength and waves as high as 35 feet. Edmund Fitzgerald went down in Canadian waters 530 feet deep and about 17 miles away from Whitefish Bay near the twin cities of Salt Ste. Marie, Michigan and Salt Ste. Marie, Ontario, a distance Edmund Fitzgerald could have covered in just over an hour at top speed. Before the accident, the captain of Edmund Fitzgerald informed the SS Arthur M. Anderson and reported, I have a bad list, lost both radars, and I'm experiencing rough waves on the deck. This sea is the worst, I've never experienced something like it. No calls for help were made before she sank, and Captain McSorley's last transmission to Arthur M. Anderson at 7.10pm was, We are holding our own. All 29 of her crew members were lost, and no remains were found. Despite several publications, research and expeditions, the reason for the sinking is still a mystery. The Edmund Fitzgerald may have been swamped and sunk due to flooding, experienced structural collapse or topside damage, or a combination of these. This tragedy is among the worst in Great Lakes maritime history. As a result of the sinking, obligatory survival jackets, depth finders, positioning devices, more freeboard and more regular vessel inspection became requirements for shipping on the Great Lakes. Design and Construction Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Firm, based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was the first American life insurance firm to make a significant investment in the iron and mining sectors, including the building of the Edmund Fitzgerald. In 1957, they hired Great Lakes Engineering Works, or GLU, of River Rouge, Michigan, to design and build the ship within a foot of the maximum length allowed for passage through the soon-to-be-completed St. Lawrence Seaway. $7 million was the estimated worth of the ship back then. The 730 foot long and 75 foot wide, Edmund Fitzgerald was the first ship to meet the maximum size requirements for the St. Lawrence Seaway. The hull's overall depth was 39 feet, while the hull depth was 33 feet and 4 inches. On August the 7th of that year, Glue placed the first Cleal plate. The Edmund Fitzgerald was the longest ship on the Great Lakes, was 729 feet long and had a deadweight capacity of 26,000 long tons. The 21 watertight cargo hatches of the Edmund Fitzgerald were 11 by 48 feet and were made from steel. Her boilers were changed from coal to oil during the 1971 and 1972 winter layup. In 1969, a diesel-powered bow thruster was added to the ship to increase its mobility. Edmund Fitzgerald's cabin was very luxurious for an ore ship. Her J.L. Hudson company designed furnishings featured thick pile carpets, tiled bathrooms, curtains over the portholes and leather swivel seats in the guest lounge. Two passenger cabins were available. 
The crew quarters had air conditioning and a number of other amenities seldom seen on ships of this kind. Meals for two dining rooms were prepared in a spacious galley. State-of-the-art nautical equipment and a beautiful map room were also included in Edmund Fitzgerald's pilot house. The company wished to honour its president and board chairman, Edmund Fitzgerald, by naming the ship after him. Fitzgerald's paternal grandpa and his great-uncles were all lake captains, and his father controlled the shipyard and repair business Milwaukee Dry Dock Company. Instead of naming the ship after himself, Fitzgerald suggested other options, such as the Centennial, Seaway, Milwaukee, and Northwestern. Even though Edmund didn't vote, the board unanimously gave the ship the name SS Edmund Fitzgerald. The June 7, 1958 naming and launch ceremony for Edmund Fitzgerald drew more than 15,000 people. Edmund Fitzgerald's sea trials lasted nine days, ending on September 22, 1958. Korea It was common practice for Northwestern Mutual to acquire vessels owned by other parties. The Ogle Bay Norton Corporation was given a 25-year contract to manage Edmund Fitzgerald. Almost immediately after acquiring Edmund Fitzgerald, Ogle Bay Norton made it the flagship of the Columbia Transportation Fleet. Edmund Fitzgerald was a workhorse that often broke her own records. In 1969, the vessel carried a record load of 27,402 long tons during a single voyage. The ship spent 17 years transporting taconite from the Iron Range mines in Duluth, Minnesota to iron plants in Detroit, Toledo and other ports. She set seasonal haul records six different times. Fitz, Pride of the American Side, Mighty Fitz, Toledo Express, Big Fitz and Titanic of the Great Lakes were just a few of her many nicknames. The loading and unloading of taconite pellets onto and from Edmund Fitzgerald took a total of around 14 hours. It took her an average of 47 trips every season, five days each way, to travel between Superior, Wisconsin and Detroit, Michigan. Although her final destination was only sometimes Toledo, Ohio, the ship often sailed between Superior, Wisconsin and any other place. By the time it was decommissioned in November 1975, the Edmund Fitzgerald had made roughly equivalent to 44 trips around the world, completing an estimated 748 round trips on the Great Lakes. Before she sank, travellers were treated like corporate guests on board. Stewards gave the visitors the red carpet treatment, as described by author Frederick Stonehouse. Guests ate the restaurant's food, and the lounge always promised complimentary refreshments. The refreshments were supplied by a little but fully stocked kitchenette. Edmund Fitzgerald was a fan favourite among boat watchers for her entire life due to her size, appearance, the string of records, and the DJ captain. Although Captain Peter Pulser was in charge of the Edmund Fitzgerald on voyages when cargo records were established, he is best remembered for piping music day or night over the ship's intercom system when travelling between St. Clair and Detroit rivers. While passing through the Sioux locks, he would often emerge from the pilot house and use a bullhorn to provide a running commentary on the history of the Edmund Fitzgerald for the benefit of passing visitors. After eight years of service without a time off worker injury, Edmund Fitzgerald was honoured with a safety award in 1969. In 1969, the ship grounded and the following year she crashed with the SS Hochelaga. She also had other accidents in the following years. She lost her first bow anchor in the Detroit River in 1974. However, none of these incidents were major. Edmund Fitzgerald still had a long future ahead of her when she went down because freshwater ships are designed to live for more than 50 years. Final Voyage and Wreck The Edmund Fitzgerald, with Captain Ernest M. McSorley at the helm, set sail from Superior, Wisconsin at 2.15pm on the afternoon of November 9, 1975. She was carrying 26,116 long tons of taconite ore pellets to the Zug Island Steel Factory in Detroit, Michigan, when she quickly achieved her top speed of 16.3 miles per hour. At around 5 o'clock, the Edmund Fitzgerald teamed up with another freighter, the Arthur M. Anderson, commanded by Jesse B. Bernie Cooper and destined for Gary, Indiana from Two Harbors, Minnesota. The National Weather Service forecasted that a storm would pass just south of Lake Superior by 7am on November 10th, which was usual for the month of November. At 4.15pm, almost two hours after Edmund Fitzgerald had left, the SS Wilfred Sykes loaded at the Burlington Northern Dock, number one, across from Edmund Fitzgerald, and set sail. Although the NWS predicted that a weak storm would skirt around Lake Superior, Captain Dudley J. Paquette of Wilfred Sykes forecasted that a big storm would hit the lake in a straight direction. From the start, he adopted a path that kept him away from the worst of the storm by sticking to the north side of the lake. 
During the first half of their journey, the crew of the Wilfred Sykes listened to the radio talks between the captains of Edmund Fitzgerald and Arthur M. Anderson and learned that they had decided to follow the standard Lake Carriers Association downbound path. At 7pm, the NWS revised their prediction and issued gale warnings for the whole of Lake Superior. At 1am on November 10th, Arthur M. Anderson and Edmund Fitzgerald shifted northwards to seek cover near the Ontario shore. Waves reached a height of 10 feet and winds were estimated at 52 knots. After 1 o'clock in the morning, Wilfred Sykes' Captain Paquette overheard McSorley explain that he had slowed the ship down due to the weather. Paquette said that he was surprised to hear McSorley, who was not renowned for detouring or slowing down, say, We're going to try for some cover near Isle Royale. You're going to leave us anyhow, so, sorry, but I have to leave you now. Winds of 35 to 50 knots were predicted by the NWS at 2am. At about 3 o'clock in the morning, the speedier Edmund Fitzgerald overtook the slower Arthur M. Anderson, which had been following at a steady 14.6 miles per hour. As the eye of the storm passed over the ships, the winds shifted from northeast to south to northwest, briefly decreasing in speed. After 1.50 pm, when Arthur M. Anderson recorded winds of 50 knots, wind speeds again increased and snow started falling at 2.45 pm, limiting visibility. Arthur M. Anderson lost sight of Edmund Fitzgerald, about 16 miles ahead at that time. At approximately 3.30 p.m., Captain McSorley radioed SS Arthur M. Anderson to inform it that Edmund Fitzgerald was taking in water and had lost two vent covers and a fence railing. The ship also started losing balance. Two of Edmund Fitzgerald's six bilge pumps were always working, releasing accumulated water from cargo. McSorley promised to slow down his ship so that Arthur M. Anderson could catch up to him. Shortly afterwards, the USCG issued a warning to all vessels that the Sioux locks were closed and that they should move to safer waters. McSorley contacted Arthur M. Anderson once again at about 4.10pm to inform him of a radar failure and continue monitoring their location. With no sight, Edmund Fitzgerald slowed down so that Arthur M. Anderson could approach within 10 miles so that she could use her radar for guidance her. At one point, Arthur M. Anderson guided the Edmund Fitzgerald into Whitefish Bay where they may have been more secure. Later that day, at 4.39pm, McSorley called the USCG station in Grand Marais, Michigan to find out whether the Whitefish Point Light and Navigation Beacon was working. The US Coast Guard said that both instruments showed no activity on their monitoring systems. McSorley immediately radioed for any nearby ships to report the status of the Whitefish Point navigational aids. At about 5.30pm, Captain Cedric Woodard of the Averforce reported that the Whitefish Point Light was operational but the radio beacon was out. According to Woodard's testimony before the Marine Board, he heard McSorley say, don't allow nobody on deck, and something more regarding event that Woodard did not catch. McSorley then reported to Woodard, I have lost all balance, I have lost both radars, and I am taking heavy seas over the deck. This is one of the worst seas I have ever been in. By the late afternoon of November the 10th, ships and observation points around Eastern Lake Superior had reported persistent winds of above 50 knots. At 4.52pm, Arthur M. Anderson recorded sustained winds of 58 knots, and by 6pm, the waves had risen to a height of up to 25 feet. Arthur M. Anderson was also hit by rogue waves as high as 35 feet and winds of 70 to 75 knots. When Arthur M. Anderson reported an upbound ship to Edmund Fitzgerald at 7.10pm, Fitzgerald inquired about the vessel's status. Despite the odds, McSorley said, We are holding our own. She then disappeared without a trace. Despite being 10 miles from land, no distress signal was heard. At 7.39pm, Captain Cooper of the Arthur M. Anderson made a radio distress call to the USCG at Salt Steam Marie on Channel 16. The USCG rescuers told him to contact back on Channel 12 because they were experiencing trouble with their communication devices. There were antennas blown down away by the storm. The upbound saltwater vessel Nanfri that Cooper phoned confirmed that she, too, was unable to detect the Edmund Fitzgerald on her radar. Cooper tried but could contact the US Coast Guard until 7.54pm. Cooper phoned the USCG again at 8.25pm to voice his worries about Edmund Fitzgerald, and at 9.03pm he officially reported her missing. At about 9pm, the USCG requested that Arthur M. Anderson return to the site of the Edmund Fitzgerald accident in search of survivors. There was a lack of suitable search and rescue boats. At around 10.30pm, the USCG requested the assistance of any commercial boats docked in or near Whitefish Bay. Initially, Arthur M. Anderson and the SS William Clay Ford searched for survivors. The weather also delayed the attempts of a third ship, the Toronto-based SS Hilda Marjan. 
It took the US Coast Guard two and a half hours to launch the boy tender Woodrush from Duluth, Minnesota, and another day to reach the search area. Over the course of three days, planes from the Canadian Coast Guard participated in the search, while the Ontario Provincial Police set up and maintained a beach patrol along the whole eastern border of Lake Superior. No crew members were located, however the lifeboats and rafts were found. The captain, first and third mates, five engineers, three oilers, a chef, a wiper, two maintenance men, three watchmen, three deckhands, three wheelsmen, two porters, a cadet and a steward made up the 29-person crew of the Edmund Fitzgerald on her last trip. The majority of the crew was comprised of individuals from the states of Ohio and Wisconsin. Their ages varied from 20 to 63. Although Edmund Fitzgerald is the biggest and most well-known shipwreck in Great Lakes history, she is not the only wreck on Lake Superior's bottom. More than 240 vessels went down in the Whitefish Point region between 1816, when the Invincible was lost, and 1975, when the Edmund Fitzgerald went down.